Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we are going to start the afternoon session. We have three talks in this session, and then uh, we start with a talk by Gavin Esler about from University College London, and Gavin will be talking about gravity current head formation and micro-breaking in shallow water, then break flows with friction. The floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me here. I think maybe I, I need to start with a semi-apology, which is that this work doesn't have very much dispersion in it. It's really outlining a problem that I think would be an interesting problem if you, if you added dispersion. I'll talk a little bit about what might happen in that case towards the end of the talk. So, um, oh, hang on. yeah, oh, sorry. I can't, uh, um, there's a delay on this mouse, and I, <laughs> I've got, <laughs> it's, it's uh, defeating me at the minute. Right, a point there, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, why study the, the, so the problem I'm going to talk about is what, ha it's just the standard dam break problem that everyone who studies some fluids will know about. Um, but with the added ingredient of, of putting in some surface friction to make the problem a bit more realistic, and just to look at the mathematics of that problem um, as, um, as it pans out in, in, in various similarity theories of, of progressive order. Uh, why would you do this? It's a, it's a very useful test case for numerical models, and bed friction is important. And I said, all, all, most, all of the dispersion in this talk is going to be fairly speculative. Um, some people already have made an attempt to solve the problem, um, the, the dam break problem in the Sarah Green Nagdi equations. I think it's fairly preliminary. And what I'm going to talk about this talk is to talk about a feature which may exist in the exact solution, which is kind of hard to pick up in numerical simulations. So um, what's the problem uh, that I'm going to solve? Um, well, we have the shallow water equations, um, abs an absolutely standard form, um, non-dimensionalized in a particular way I'll talk about in a moment, so that you have um, just a, 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 um, an equation for height, fluid depth H and velocity U. Um, and there's a friction term there, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, everything's non-dimensionalized, so that uh, constants are unity in the problem. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm just getting used to this device delay. Right, um, so uh, um, the key point I want to make on this slide is this is a zero parameter problem, because you can scale um, all of the coefficients with what, what, what would be appearing in the dimensional version of the equation, you'd have a g multiple here and a, and a friction coefficient here, and the, there'd be a height h appearing in initial conditions. You can get rid of all of those just by choosing the correct scaling. So, you've, so it's a zero parameter problem, and so any asymptotics that you do, this means um, have to be either small time or large time asymptotics, t t where time is the, uh, time or time to the minus one is going to be the, the small parameter we're going to be using. Um, so that makes life a bit easier for numerical simulation because there's only one problem to solve. Uh, yep. Um, so what about the term on the right, the, the bed friction? Well, it's a quadratic drag law, um, and there are two type values of alpha which are kind of important in applications. Well, what, one is the kind of sim simplest physical law where you take a quadratic drag law and apply it over the depth of the fluid. So it gives you a 1 over h appearing uh, on the denominator there. And the other um, value is one which is kind of used widely in the engineering community, uh, which has kind of been empirically verified in all kinds of ex um, experiments of different situations, and that's where you take alpha to be four thirds. And if you assume, uh, the, the, these authors have take, uh, kind of assumed a log, a log layer, a boundary layer, and, um, uh, and from, 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 a, from a model of a log layer boundary, the statistics of those have derived this law uh, asymptotically. So, um, so there is some justification for using a four-thirds law in a, tur in a turbulent flow. Um, okay, so everyone is probably familiar with the Ritter solution, which dates back to the 19th century, which is that um, when friction is absent, 
um, you just you have a similarity theory, which is to, uh, there's no space or there's no there's no space or length scale in the problem at all, and you have a similarity theory which can be written out in terms of the variable x over t, and h has a parabolic profile and u has a linear profile um, in between the, the dam break rear at x equals or in our x over t is minus one in our non-dimensional variables and the dam break front at x over t equals two. Um, so hopefully that's familiar to everyone. It's a sort of standard expansion fan or rarefaction wave problem solution. Okay. Um, so uh, what does a more realistic dam break flow look like uh, in an experiment? Well, it, uh, this is a sketch from um, a, a, re a recent um, paper sim simulating the, 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 these flows, but also with some with friction. Um, the, the, well, the main thing that we're going to be focus, focusing on is this tip region here, which obviously differs from the Ritter solution. It becomes rounded and it's re retarded relative to the, to the Ritter solution. Um, and um, the study of this goes back to the father of nonlinear waves, Whitham. Um, and uh, he developed a sort of semi heuristic theory for this tip region, uh, although it's a, very, it's a very insightful and accurate semi heuristic theory. And in particular, he points out that the um, the width of this tip region uh, grows as time to the four thirds and its height is time to two thirds. So consistent with a, it being a small time theory for uh, the, the dam break problem. So you can think of, um, so that kind of inspired other authors to develop an asymptotic theory which works at small times. Um, and um, the, 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 the satisfactory version of that I think is given by, uh, oh sorry, uh, is given by um, Hogg and Pritchard in a 2004 paper. And they, they just point out that you can, you can create a similarity theory for what happens in the tip region if you expand H and U in, in, the, in, the, in, the following, um, in the following expansions. And the key variable here is the similarity variable X, which is, is the distance from the tip of the Ritter solution, so that where the dam break would be if there was no friction, um, divided by time to the four thirds. And when you plug this expansion uh, into the shallow water equations, you get uh, equations for the leading order height and velocity, the leading order height field and the velocity correction, uh, which I'm going to call the hogg pritchard Wissem equations or HPW for the rest of the talk. And uh, so they're, they're ordinary differential equations in this ca capital A H and U. And uh, you, what, what, what you imagine is that the solution of this gives you the shape the shape of the correction to the dam break theory. So they come with some boundary conditions. Um, there's a sort of kinematic condition that the front of the hogg pritchard Whittem equations has to match the velocity, um, the, 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 speed of, the speed of that front in the, as it moves in the coordinate system, which corresponds to this condition. And um, at the rear, you have to match to the Ritter solution because this is a theory of the tip, and as you move away from the tip to big X equals minus infinity, you just need to, you need to join up to the, to the original Ritter solution, uh, which gives these uh, sort of simple limiting cases. So um, that all sounds very straightforward. Why not just solve these ODEs and get the answer? Well, there is a sort of, there's a sort of technical issue which kind of interested me and was the kind of topic of uh, um, MSc projects for some of my students who are my co-authors on this, if you like. Uh, and uh, wh wh why is it interesting? Well, there's some critical behavior of these HPW equations, and that becomes obvious when you kind of write them in this matrix form. Um, uh, wh wh when you do that, um, uh, you have uh, a matrix A multiplying the, uh, the uh, vector of uh, prognostic variables, um, and um, the classification of the solutions is going to depend on the determinant of this matrix. And in particular, if there's a critical point where this delta, the, well, the determinant equals zero, uh, then the, the two equations are going to become linearly dependent, and that's going to require some patching up of the solution between uh, a point to one side, one side of the critical point and the other. And it turns out that uh, there, there's, there has to be a critical point in the problem. And you can see that if you just do a local analysis of what have to happens where, near the front where the solution hits the bed, uh, where, uh, well, H uh, 
the determinant delta there is dominated by h, which is um, uh, given by the square root of the distance from the front, and that means the determinant is negative there. And, uh, but as you go to the rear and look at what happens as you converge the Ritter solution, you know that delta is positive there. So that, that means there has to be a point somewhere on this solution of these equations uh, where there's a critical transition where delta goes from positive to negative. So that's kind of the, the, kind of the thing that interested me about this problem. Um, and one thing that we noticed when we were reading Hogg and Pritchard is that uh, they weren't so, quite so interested in this aspect of the problem. They kind of made an assumption that there was a, a critical point where the front and rear solutions can meet at a gradient discontinuity. And uh, we did looked at this issue in detail. Um, and um, first of all, we noticed that if, um, uh, if such a critical point exists, uh, well, um, what, what happens at that critical point, just going back to the previous slide, is that the two equations for h and u become linearly dependent at that point, and that imposes a solvability condition on the right-hand side of the equation, which uh, looks like this. And um, that means that, the, there's a, that there, there's a kind of finite locus of possible critical point locations, hc, uc, which is parameterized by the coordinate x. Um, and we noticed there were two kind of critical problems one is that the rear solution, which is unique, doesn't cross this locus of possible critical points. And the second problem is if you actually linearize the equations about a hypothetical critical point um, and do lots of work, and that was one of the projects, um, you end up with this equation where gamma here is actually the gradient in the, in the velocity correction field. Um, you end up with that, uh, that the, this, this quadratic has to have real roots for a gradient discontinuity to be possible at the critical point. And when you plug in the value for which you expect the critical point to, um, to be at, which is around 1.8 whenever we do our numerical calculations, you see this isn't satisfied. And so you can't have um, a critical point uh, of the type that Hogg and Pritchard assumed, even though, um, and we'll see why they kind of just didn't, didn't kind of focus on this whenever you actually look at the numerics. Um, see. Uh, but um, first of all, I'll just talk about a bit about how, how we might patch the solution up instead. So if we can't use a critical point, well, what else could we put in to the solution to kind of uh, make, um, come up with a, with a, with a, a solution to this HWP equation, equation set? Well, the most natural thing to think about is um, hydraulic jump. And here the analogy is with um, flow over topography where we're kind of imagining that the, um, the tip of fluid, which has been decelerated by the friction, is kind of playing the role of an obstacle. And um, if, if um, you have supercritical flow hitting an obstacle, usually you have a, um, a, recover, a, a recovery hy hydraulic jump at the, at the, at, 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 on the upstream side of the obstacle. And that's the kind of uh, situation which we're envisioning, envisioning here. And when you plug in um, the, uh, you do the analysis on the sort of con conservative form of the shallow water equations, you come up with uh, hydraulic jump conditions within the, the, um, the, 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 the um, HPW equations. So this is um, a connection, um, ranking Huguenot laws, if you like, for um, sta a stationary jump in, this, um, in, in these equations, because um, I, the, 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 jump ha the jump has to be stationary to be consistent with the expansion. Um, and uh, so, so these are the rank and Huguenot conditions that have to be satisfied at, 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 at such a jump. Um, so uh, we then kind of embarked upon a, a shooting method to try to solve the equations uh, fitting one of these jumps in. And the way in which you do it is you, um, the, the uh, variable that's unknown for the shooting method is the, is the exact front position here. And so you can solve for the front solution going backwards from this point. And then the idea is that you, if you vary the position of this point, you can keep adjusting until um, the, uh, front so the image of the front solution under a hydraulic jump meets the rear solution uh, at the same point in x for both u and h. And um, if you apply the shooting method correctly, you can fi find that position x equals x. You can find the position the front position xf, 
which gives you a consistent jump position xj. And that this, this sort of shows a blow up over um, the jump position. And um, the striking thing about it is that the hydraulic jump that you find is, is extremely tiny. I think that's probably why Hogg and Pritchard didn't pick up on this point because I think they didn't use a sort of a ODE solver with adjustable time steps and they just kind of plowed through this point whenever they were sol solving the problem. Um, so this seems to, be, seems to us to be the only way you can construct a consistent solution of these, of, of, uh, of, um, for the similarity theory for the, uh, in, for the Hogg and Pritchard equation, the Hogg Pritchard Whitman equation. Uh, okay, um, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about late time asymptotics, uh, um, which also is uh, kind of solvable for this system in a minute. But um, first of all, let's try to um, validate this theory using um, some shallow water numerical uh, computations. And this is just a, a computation, it's uh, just a solution straightforward of the dam break problem using a, a finite volume uh, code claw, based on claw pack. Um, it uses, uh, there's a name of the Riemann, approximate Riemann solver that uh, follows the one by Hartmann, Lax, Van Leer, and Einfeld. Um, and uh, there, there's some flux limiters um, which um, are, um, improve the treatment of um, discontinuities. Um, one issue that we had is that with this scheme, we seem to need a wetting layer to maintain stability. And um, this, the scheme is quite good for dealing with low values of the, of the height, which are a problem for these methods, but we still needed to use a wetting layer, which is 10, 10 to the minus seven times the initial height. Uh, even that seems to create an issue. It's like a friction terms we deal with by um, splitting, so you solve the, um, the, the, the dynamical part of the equation and the frictional part in separate steps. And you can use a range of resolutions to uh, kind of investigate different time scales in the problem. Uh, so first of all, what happens uh, if you plot uh, the solutions that you get from the numerical code uh, scaled as you would scale the Ritter solution, so plotting everything as, uh, 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 as a function of x over time. Uh, height, so here's height as a function of x over time. Well, you see um, the, 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 um, <coughs> the, the, the tip caused by the friction doing kind of what you expect. It's, um, it, 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 um, it's, it, it goes, the, the tip of the, um, of, the, of the frictional down break moves slower than the Ritter solution, and so this moves back, backward, back backwards in, in, this, in this diagram. So more interesting then is what happens if you then try to scale these solutions using the scaling of, um, the, of the, the hogg pritchard witten similarity theory instead. Uh, so this is plotting the same solutions now as a function of um, distance from the wit, wit, the, wit, the, wit and the Ritter tip divided by time to the four thirds. And here is the um, uh, solution of the Hogg-Pritchard-Witham equation in blue. And then the black curves show um, the, uh, the, sim, um, the, the, the numerical solutions plotted for different times and included as a very early time to try to capture the hydraulic jump here. And um, so it's a source of disappointment and frustration to me that I don't think our code is being very successful at early times. Uh, in particular, there's a kind of a, a nose, nose shock here, which is we don't, I don't believe is physical. Um, and the code is not capturing uh, the dynamics around the jump. And the reason for that is not really clear at the moment, uh, whether it's a kind of numerical issue or an issue to, or, or, or a, um, a mathematical issue related to the, 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 um, uh, the asymptotic theory not being realized for some reason. Um, but anyway, the, the, the approximate position of the, uh, of the solution is, is showing up in the shallow water equation. So it's, it, 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 um, it's clear the code is, do, is, is on the right lines, but um, there are kind of the technical issues related to initialization and the numerics of the code, and in particular, the wetting layer, all of which need, need looking at. Um, so yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> so just to, to give you a visualization of what happens in space and time, here's the sort of standard sort of space time diagram you often plot. So, so the, the, the expansion fan of the Ritter solution is this given by the usual expansion fan uh, curves here. 
the um, the blue the blue the blue curve here shows the the location of the front of the um, of, of, of the frictional downbreak, and the red one shows the location of, of the jump, if it, if it exists. Just to show you that, um, and one of the reasons I'm showing this is because um, we're going to think about late time solutions in a moment, um, and um, one of the reasons you know that you kind of need a, you need a completely different, sometimes asymptotic theories work for time order, small time theory might work for time order one, we kind of know that's not going to be the case here because the, um, the tip region expands as, as t to the four thirds, whereas the Ritter, the expand, and the rarefaction wave of the Ritter solution is expanding just as proportional to time. So we know that this tip region is going to overwhelm um, the, the Ritter solution after a, a certain amount of time. Uh, yeah, so um, just to think about a bit about the late time behavior. Um, so as I said, the uh, the, uh, uh, the tip region is going to overwhelm the entire expansion fan, so we know the solution is going to break down. And so, um, what about um, uh, doing an asymptotic theory for large time and looking at that? Well, it turns out that there's a, a kind of well known approximation that's a heuristic approximation used in the engineering community, um, which is just that um, y if you delete the acceleration term from the momentum equations and assume the balance between um, the, the, the uh, the, the, um, the gradient of the, of the surface height and the, and the drag, well then you, you end up with a nonlinear diffusion equation and the results I'm going to show from an asymptotic theory at leading order turn out to be the same as solving this nonlinear diffusion equation for the same problem. Uh, oh hang on, that's the same picture. Right, um, so, um, oh. Yeah, so, so Similar idea then, if you just if you put in the following similarity theory uh, uh, with the idea of looking at late times, um, height, both height and velocity here are, are a function of a similarity variable x to the t, x t to the minus two thirds. Uh, you get a re you get the relationship between u and h that co that corresponds to the um, uh, the, d uh, the balance I was just talking about. And that you end up with a nonlinear equation in H for the profile, which you can also solve by the shooting method. And this theory um, is also, well, it, it, it turns out to be uh, to, um, to give good convergence, uh, although it, the convergence is rather slow. Uh, the the, the um, solid lines show here, show here the numerics, and you can kind of see uh, the dam break, uh, the remnants of the Ritter solution. Um, uh, up here at earlier times and uh, uh, gradually converge to, to converges to the similarity profile that comes out of solving that nonlinear equation. Um, so just to conclude, um, I I if you believe in this asymptotic theory, similarity theory for the tip of the dam break, and there's no reason not to, I don't think, uh, then the only way of actually solving these similarity equations is to include this small micro-breaking uh, hydraulic jump uh, in, the head, in the head of the gravity current. And um, to my frustration, is we haven't been able to confirm this or, 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 dis, or disprove it by, with, with, with the numerics as, as so far investigated. And I hope this is gonna be uh, uh, the next, the key, the key thing to do with this problem going forward. Um, but if the little jump is robust, it's kind of, it kind of does make an interesting problem in dispersive hydrodynamics, because if you regularize the jump with dispersion, well, it's not exactly analogous to the nonlinear dispersive wave trains generated by topography, uh, because the jump that you get is steady, not in the um, frame of, in which the dispersion relation is invariant, but um, in, a, in a frame which is uh, expanding relative to the, um, uh, um, to, to the dispersion relation. So you have a dilating undular bore, which kind of might be might be an interesting fe feature um, and wor worth further study. And this is very much a work in progress. Questions? Thanks for the very interesting talk. I'm, I'm curious about the numerics. 
Uh, you mentioned that your code is based on Clopac. Does that mean you're using Clopac or that you wrote a code based yeah, on I, similar I, I, I ideas? I or? Just for fun, I wrote, I, to understand it better, I wrote a MATLAB version of Clopac, but it, it's, the same, it's okay. the same code, essentially. Okay, because in the current version of Clopac, there's a lot of uh, very specialized shallow water solvers you know, yeah, uh, the, because the, the how do you handle the, the wetting yeah. and drying, right? And, and that kind of thing uh, is very important. Yeah, so, so, I, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fully conversant with all of that, but I think the HLLE solver is, is meant to be one of the ones that's best suited to that. I'm not sure I'm using the right limiters for doing a, for, for doing a good job, but, um, but there are okay. definitely issues with um, need, comp having a completely dry layer, I think is, makes it a difficult problem mm -hmm. numerically. Yeah, it'd be good to, to chat yeah. about it. I'd be really interested in trying to, to see if we can get something better. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank Gavin again. Thank you. Thanks.